In this episode of Detroit Performs, Detroit Medical Center doctors and med students put down their medical instruments and pick up musical instruments. The U of M Health System brings arts to the bedside and beyond. And we see where the eye meets art. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm DJ Oliver and welcome to Detroit Performs. While meeting all the artists here at Detroit Performs, we've seen how art can not only be interesting and inspiring, but also can have a calming effect. And there's no better place to calm people than the medical world. Today, we're gonna do just that, show you art in the medical world. I'm standing here at Detroit Receiving Hospital to show you around its art gallery, which does its part to help beautify a building filled with the stressful rush of medicine and hopefully help calm its visitors. We'll get to more of what's inside later, but first up, Take a look at how these Detroit Medical Center doctors and med students turn their passion for music into a creative outlet for their busy lives. Music throughout the ages has been used as a way of galvanizing people's souls. We're kind of filling a niche that I didn't realize before, but it's probably a niche that needs to be filled. There's a community orchestra in Detroit that's not part of the symphony, it's not part of the Youth Symphony. The Detroit Medical Orchestra is um, one of a few medical orchestras um, in the U.S. Um, that brings together medical professionals um, to be in a community orchestra. We're a group of physicians, medical students, uh, nurses, other medically related personnel that came together to do orchestral music. And it started several years ago when a medical student uh, who had previously studied in a music school was missing playing music. She was a performance major in undergrad, so she wanted to bring together like-minded people with the same kind of aspirations to form an organized uh, group of playing, you know, and so she had a friend who was a conductor and she kind of got it started. I think they started with maybe 20 people and that was a big deal. Um, and now it's grown into a huge thing. We have several people in the orchestra who didn't play for many years. And then when the orchestra formed, they pulled their instruments out of the closet and repaired them and brought them into tip-top shape and started playing again. And I think that's very rewarding for a lot of people. I came here for a graduate program to get a master's in basic medical sciences at Wayne State School of Medicine. And I'd always been in orchestras before, including in undergrad, and I missed it within the first couple of months of coming to school. I knew I had to do it again. So I started asking around if there was an orchestra and it happened that there was one formed within the last six months that I had arrived. So they got me in touch with the person who was in charge, which was Michelle Eubles, the founder. And then I started playing and I haven't stopped since. Playing the violin and being part of an orchestra, it's, it's always been a part of my life. So when this opportunity came up for, you know, an orchestra that caters to medical professionals, people involved in medicine. Um, it was just like a perfect fit for me to, to pick back um, or pick up my violin again um, and start playing again. Medicine is a, uh, a unique pursuit. It's, it's a wonderful career. I've been practicing now for about 30 years. But day in, day out, you, uh, it, it takes a bit of a toll and there has to be a well uh, where you obtain your compassion, where you nurture your soul. And music is a wonderful way of doing that. It's a great outlet. Um, after a long week of you know, seeing patients um, and, and thinking critically um, about medicine, and then to have that one rehearsal um, on Sunday evenings where you are thinking in a completely different way, um, I, I, it's just a great release for a lot of um, our members and they, they really value that. I'm not trying to retain anything while I'm in the orchestra. I'm not trying to memorize anything of, this is gonna, you know, I'll need to know this or else I won't be able to save somebody's life in the future. Sunday we get together and it's 
two and a half unadulterated hours of just playing music and kind of letting your mind wander off and just like be in a space that's not related to any of your day-to-day -day worries. I think um, music might be particularly, you know, fit for people pursuing medicine because it's, it's a craft and you kind of have to work really hard at fine details. Doing surgery is a lot like playing a piece of classical music. It's choreographed and uh, you have to do um, delicate moves, you have to have good um, uh, motor coordination and uh, it's a series of things that progresses in units of time from the start to the finish and you have to sort of choreograph the surgery just like you play through a, a, a score of a symphony. We are playing the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony I think is ideal for the city of Detroit. The city of Detroit is now having an incredibly difficult time and um, basically now, I think there, we might be seeing a renaissance. We decided to do the symphony because um, it's our fifth year of being um, the DMO. Um, and we just thought that we've come so far. Uh, we started from a 30-person orchestra, very small orchestra, to um, over 70 people now. Um, and so we just wanted to celebrate that growth um, and really celebrate Detroit. We're joining with um, the United Voices of Detroit. Um, it's a community choir, um, as well as the Detroit School of Arts um, Vision Ensemble. Uh, it's like male high school students from uh, here in the city. So it's very impressive that they're, you know, picking up the German and, and singing uh, this very challenging work. It's something that we're really proud to share with Detroit and to bring people who might not be familiar with classical music. In, you know, a, a good introduction into classical music. At each of our concerts, we decided that we weren't going to charge admission for the concert, but then we would ask the audience to make donations to a worthy cause. And for each of our concerts, we have raised money for several uh, organizations in and around Detroit that are usually related to uh, medicine in some way. We want this to remain accessible to everyone in Detroit and everyone in the, in the area because we think that one of our biggest messages is to bring the message of music promoting healing to all of Detroit. It's, it's really magical that so many people um, volunteer their time and effort and resources um, to make this possible. For other community orchestras, when they do Beethoven's Ninth, it's a huge event. Um, and the fact that we were able to do this, it's, it's pretty impressive. It's a way of feeling uh, bigger than yourself. Especially when you're participating in that final product, you have now created something larger than yourself. So it's an absolutely wonderful feeling. You can learn more about the Detroit Medical Orchestra as well as all the other artists featured here today by heading to DetroitReforms.org. I'm standing in front of a beautiful quilt made with some of the important facets of the city of Detroit. Patients, visitors, and medical staff can stand back and gain a sense of our city's history right here in the hospital. Our next segment takes us down Highway 94 to the University of Michigan Health System. There, Elaine Sims is a director of the Gifts of Art program, in which art galleries, concerts, and bedside musicians are just a taste of the entertainment the program offers its patients at U of M. So you enter the hospital as a patient, you've got a life and death experience, you're all alone. I mean, you may have your loved ones, but you lose your identity, you're in a hospital gown. So when someone comes with music, someone comes with art, there's that magical component. We hear patients say over and over, my healing began the day you came to my room. The Gifts of Art program was actually planned as this hospital that we're sitting in was being planned and designed in the early 1980s. So it actually opened with the hospital in 1986 and has been here ever since. Today, I would say that Gifts of Art is one of the most comprehensive
programs in the country, if not the world. We have nine galleries throughout the health system that we change every two months. So we have about 50 shows a year that we put on. If you want to get out of your room and take a walk or as you're going for tests, you can see the artwork, you can see pieces of art, you can see pottery, you can see all kinds of things, which it does help with the healing because it gives you a distraction from what your own problems are. We have had people, um, especially in this space here, when they come out of the clinic and they'll say, you know, I came out and the first thing I saw was this beautiful art on the wall and how that really, you know, helped me get through, you know, that moment in my life. So a lot of our artists look at it as, um, you know, giving back to community. We have weekly concerts every Thursday. They're inside during the year and in the summer when there isn't rain. We let loose a little bit outside and this is a Cajun group. We do invite every patient the evening before and the morning they get an invitation on their meal tray so they know it's happening. Over the years we started moving things closer and closer to where it really has an impact and that's at the bedside of patients. I once was lost, but now Patients come up with tears in their eyes, and, and an, you know, an artist reads the audience members, and for them it is such an authentic moment, it's such a personal connection. It takes them to you know, the essence of why they make music. The hospital has a good thing going on here. When they, you're in a gloomy spot where you look out the window and it's so sunny, but you can't be out there. So by being in here and them having these small gifts of art, you know, it, it helps get me through this time period. Each time it was like perfect timing uh, when a musician came in and they lifted and encouraged me, whatever I was going through that day. And the variety of music, oh my goodness, just, just wonderful, wonderful. Everything else in my mind disappears. At the moment they start playing, I'm able to go into another world and I just relax and I take, my tension goes down in my shoulders and, and then I, I just have uh, more hope for the future and what's ahead. Yeah, well, here come my doctor with some good news, I hope. Get me out of this place. I am tired of all this dope, yeah. Being able to, to laugh, it was therapy to my spirit and to my body to be able to, to laugh. They tell you, you know, to be stress-free. And um, um, for me, you know, I was always stressed, but I made myself stressed a lot of times, worrying about things. So then the gift of art would come in and kind of de-stress me. <laughs> I love being here. I love wandering around the hospital and seeing the impact on people. We're pretty well known through the hospital, those of us who put the art out there, which is wonderful. The first visual art that I notice when I'm brought to a room is the one, the artwork that is hanging in the room, and that can be changed. I have about 30 plus volunteers that go daily to the patient floors and they take a cart full of artwork and the patients get to choose the artwork for their rooms um, during their stay. Usually once a week a uh, cart comes by, somebody will come in your room and ask if you like the art that you have uh, or they'll say would you like to see what else we have to offer and each and every time since I'm in here numerous times the book is different so it's kind of nice to be able to say oh I'd like to change that it's like it's like changing the wallpaper in your house you it's it's a nice refreshing thing to look at. Georgianne here I've got an art project that we can do for later um, it has handmade papers ribbons um, it's a greeting card. You're not going to come to the hospital with a bag full of crafts so for them to be able to bring it to you is is very important very helpful.
They have an art cart that comes with projects. They have all the things you need to make, whether it's a card. I've made bracelets. Uh, they have coloring books for adults. So it's very, it's very nice to have that. And, and once again, if the person that is bringing that to you sees that, that you're like a sponge to the arts, they offer other things that maybe they don't have on their cart, but they can bring to you. I'm just really glad that this program is here. It really is a partnership between the arts world and the healthcare world. And both sides come to it with expertise, but with goals, you know, with a vision. I still have things I haven't done that I want to do. We're starting a dance for Parkinson's group with our Parkinson's outpatients, and I'd love to have dance and movement at the bedside. You know, studies show that just watching movement and dance has the same impact on the brain as doing the movement itself. So there's lots more I still want to do, and I'm hoping that I can see some more of these and then pass it on to someone, because there's always going to be more. My sweet Now that right there is why we say hail to the victors. To find out more about the Gifts of Art program at the University of Michigan, as well as all the other Detroit Perform artists, art events, and art programs, head to DetroitPerforms.org. I'm standing here with Ruth Kramer, the Detroit Receiving Hospital's Corporate Director of Integrated Marketing and Communications. That's Hi. a big title there, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Who came up with the idea to put artwork in the hospital and why? Oh, she was a brilliant lady. Okay. Actually, it was uh, Alexander Walt, the chief of surgery at the time uh, that Detroit Receiving was being built. They were at Detroit General. And this hospital was being built to be a dedicated emergency services hospital. And Dr. Walt asked his wife, Irene, to do something about the walls. It looked too institutional. He said, get some art here. Mm -hmm. And she did a phenomenal job. And as she became better known for what she was doing here at Detroit, people were attracted to her and people came to her. And this collection today is just unstoppable. I think when patients, visitors, guests come here, they have a better sense of uh, calm and uh, serenity because art is what you bring into it. It's what you get out of it. Mm -hmm. And to have these kinds of peaceful pieces in the works for people to absorb and deal with while they're going through something else. It's an important consideration. Absolutely. And it was absolutely what Dr. Walt had in mind when he asked his wife to do something. Well, this has been an amazing experience. I must thank you so much for sharing oh, all that you. insight with thank us you. here at Detroit Performs. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Ruth. We appreciate thank that. You. Now let's take a look at some upcoming events happening in and around our city. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit ICSITY.com. These paintings' bold colors really caught my eye. They are Sunshine People by Dutch artist Karel Appel, whose dynamic and vibrant work was influential for American and European artists. The style will remind you of Picasso, Matisse, and Dupuffet, all post-impressionist painters. But right now, though, we're going to take you to the Impressionist era. The Impressionists and their blurred brushstrokes shocked the art world in the 1800s. In this next story, you see why some experts believe there was a medical reason for this style of art. When you look at some of the works of the Impressionists, to the first observer, it just looks sort of blurry. Well, people who are nearsighted see the world without their glasses as sort of blurry. So 
somewhere along the line, some people thought that, well, maybe just the Impressionists were just a bunch of people with nearsightedness. When Paul Cezanne exhibited in the very first Impressionist show, there was an interesting quote from an art critic who was so uh, shocked with the, the look of this, they said he must have a diseased retina. He's created this whole new form of art because his eyes must be so poor. Similarly, people look at uh, the works of artists like El Greco and Giacometti and uh, Modigliani, and all of those artists would paint or do sculptures in a very elongated, exaggerated sort of fashion. Again, someone wondered, uh, well, gosh, I wonder if they have some sort of astigmatism. And astigmatism is a condition of the eye where the curvature of the eye is not perfectly spherical, and it causes blurring in one direction as opposed to another. And it turns out that Impressionism is way more than just an eye condition. I mean, it's a, a, a revolutionary movement in art in France in the late 1800s. And, you know, glasses were widely available then. There was not any such thing as somebody that went without glasses. Edgar Degas was really one of the founding fathers of French Impressionism. He suffered from a loss of vision in one eye in his early 30s, and he was basically legally blind in both eyes uh, by about his mid-30s. He lost vision in the macula, the centermost part of the retina that's responsible for our fine, detailed vision. And this shows up in his works where early he does these exquisite paintings of uh, girls in the ballet school, for example, and, and he would paint that over and over and over again. But then there's some very late Degas uh, pastels where he's painting the same theme, a, a ballet dancer. But you can tell that the contrast between his earlier style and the later style is just a lot more coarse. The details are kind of lost, and it's very evident when you compare those two works that he's lost vision. You ask someone about Impressionism and everyone seems to gravitate towards Monet. Well, Monet ends up having cataracts late in his life. And these cataracts develop in roughly the 19-teens to 1920s. And cataract surgery was possible, but it was not nearly as sophisticated as it is now. He eventually, after seeing six ophthalmologists, ends up having cataract surgery, but up until that point, we can kind of see a gradual deterioration in his vision. A cataract will absorb blue, violets, and greens, and so it leaves the world sort of a muddy color. As Monet, in fact, after his cataract surgery, complained bitterly. He talked about how the colors were exaggerated, and he couldn't quite get used to the fact that he was actually seeing real colors now, and he'd been so acclimated to seeing yellows and browns. Nothing probably illustrates this better than something that he would paint over and over, which is the, the little Japanese footbridge at Giverny. And there are early works of this from around 1900. He paints them. The water lilies are beautifully reflecting in the pond, and there's just really exquisite detail. And even his brush strokes, are, there's different colors rendered just within a single brush stroke. And then we get to a, a much later work in about 1922. He paints that same uh, Japanese footbridge and now the colors are way off. They're yellows and browns and very muddy because of a very, very thick cataract. And he's looking through these cataracts and painting through this. And that work from 1922 really reflects his poor vision that he was struggling with at the time. He sort of finally ends up recovering in around 1925. He finished the water lilies, and, and he's sort of back to his old style that, that all of us have sort of come to love. The 
idea that Impressionism might have been born out of uh, just a need for glasses is, is probably pretty inaccurate. These are sort of conscious, artistic decisions and not an eye condition. To find out more about all the artists featured here today, visit the Detroit Reforms website. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Reforms. For more arts and culture, head to DetroitReforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. I'd like to thank the Detroit Receiving Hospital for having us out here today, and also taking in the artwork that decorate their halls and their courtyards. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit reforms, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.